Hi, I'm Goose, and welcome back to part two of me going into way more detail than is necessary about something that I have hyper-focused on. Part one is right here, so if you want to go back and watch that, that's where you can do it. But today, we are going to be talking about... Last time, we talked about the evolution of halftone, which is a way to create gradients out of solid colors by using different sizes of dots. This was an innovation caused by the introduction of photography into printing in the early 1800s. In the 1950s, another discovery changed everything and reshaped the way that we live our lives, even today. That discovery was the digital display. In 1957, Russell Kirsch managed to scan a picture of his son and display it on a tiny screen, just 175 by 175 pixels. This was the first time an image had been displayed digitally. Notice how the image is split into solid values? This is called banding. Early displays had a very limited capacity to display variations in value and color. They weren't able to show smooth gradients, so they just got as close as they could, just like we do with our block choices. This is called quantization. Let's say you're trying to display this gradient from black to white, but you can only use these five blocks. You have to pick whichever one is closest to each value, or quantize it, and stick with it since they're your only options. This technically works, but we have a lot of banding. If only there was a way to make banding less of an issue. And that is where dithering comes in. In 1961, a man named Larry Roberts realized that he could make the banding caused by quantization less noticeable if he shook things up a little bit and added some randomization. As the computer scanned across the image, it would look at each pixel and decide what the closest value was that it could display, just like we did with the gradient. But Larry programmed it to occasionally get it wrong. This introduced what's called noise into the image and made the gradients look smoother. Just like with halftone, our brain sees patterns like this and tricks itself into thinking that it's just closer to the gradient. It's also called optical mixing. There's a tool in Axiom we can use to do this for us. Axiom is a wonderful creative mod for Minecraft, and I highly recommend checking it out. Right now, we're going to be looking at the gradient painter tool. On the left side, we can choose which blocks are going to be in our gradient and what percentage of the gradient those blocks are going to make up. When we paint our gradient down, we get a gradient just like we did before. By default, we still have this issue with color banding, but there is something that we can do about that. If we select this setting right here, it introduces random noise into the gradient, just like Larry Roberts did, and creates a smoother looking gradient. There's a second setting as well that is going to increase the randomization by using a different algorithm. This randomization to reduce banding is the basis of all dithering. This is a website you can use yourself to see how dithering looks with different settings. I used this a lot while researching this video. You can see how adding noise really makes an image look a lot more legible. But we are just getting started. Look at how long this list is. These are all different algorithms for dithering that produce different results. I want to take a second to talk about one of these categories in particular before we talk about color. And that section is error diffusion. When an image is quantized, it has to round up or round down the value of each pixel until it matches something that it can display. Because of this, almost every pixel will have a certain amount of error or amount that it was rounded. Let's say that we're trying to quantize this image of a very detailed eye. Now we can't make gray if our only option is white or black. So the computer has to just pick whichever value is closer and use that. In this case, the white concrete and the smooth stone are going to be closer to the snow block. So the snow block is going to fill in every area that we have white concrete or smooth stone. Even though the snow block is brighter than both of those, those are closer to snow block than they are to black concrete. Black concrete is going to fill in for the deep slate and for the gray concrete. You can see how we lose a lot of detail when we quantize an image. This is called threshold quantization. If something is brighter than a certain value, it's white. And if something is darker than a certain value, it's black. As the computer scans across the image, it checks each pixel. If it is between zero and 49, it rounds down and turns the pixel off. If it is between 50 and 100, it rounds up and turns it on. 
This is how you end up with images like this. If it's darker than a certain threshold, it's black. And if it's lighter than that threshold, it's white. There's no in between. Adding a little bit of random noise to an image can help, but as always, we wanted to find out a way to make it look even better. In 1971, Robert Floyd and Louis Steinberg introduced error diffusion, and they named their new algorithm the Floyd-Steinberg algorithm. This new algorithm took all of these rounding errors and spread them out or diffused them over multiple pixels. Here's an example. This right here is called a kernel. This is the set of instructions that the Floyd-Steinberg algorithm follows when spreading out that error. The pixel it is currently on is represented by the magenta square. The fractions represent what portion of this error each surrounding pixel will receive. Now, don't worry, I'm going to try to explain this entire thing without using any of the numbers or math first so that you guys can more understand the principle of what's happening. And then at the very end, I'll bring the math back in so the people that are interested in that can see how those numbers line up. We'll scan through the image one pixel at a time. We're assuming that this gray has a value of 64, which means it's just a little bit lighter than middle gray. So the first pixel is going to end up as white. Because we made this pixel lighter than the original image, we're going to balance that out by making the surrounding pixels a little bit darker. You'll end up with something a little bit like this, but we still have the problem that these are gray and we can't display gray. So when the computer moves over to the next pixel, it applies the same algorithm. This is darker than middle gray, so this one will end up as black. Since we made this one darker, we're going to balance it out by making the ones around it lighter. Now that we've updated the pixels around it, we'll move on to the next one. Since this one, again, is brighter than 50%, this one will become white as well. Since we made this one lighter, we'll be making the pixels around it darker to balance it out. We'll follow this same pattern for every pixel as we scan our way across the image. Again, this one is going to become white as well, which is going to darken the pixels around it. Once we've done this one pixel at a time for the entire image, we're going to end up with something like this. While this may not look any better than the way we had it before, once we put this in a repeating pattern at a very large scale, we're going to get something that appears a little bit more gray than it did with just the white blocks. It's going to look something like this. Now for the math. With error diffusion, each time a pixel is rounded up or down, the computer checks to see how much it was rounded. In this case, it was rounded from 60 up to 100. That leaves an error of positive 40. This error is divided into 16 parts and inverted before being distributed to the surrounding pixels according to the kernel of the algorithm. This is repeated for every pixel as it scans across the image. We have an end result looking like this. Every one of these algorithms has a different kernel that processes a different appearance. For example, Atkinson diffuses the errors using this pattern instead. Some of these are made in an attempt to make a more accurate image, while others are designed to simply reduce the file size of an image. So far, we've only discussed black and white dithering. It's time to move into color, and this is where dithering really gets to shine. Remember banding? Well, this is even more prevalent in color than it is in black and white. You've probably noticed this while watching a movie, especially one with a lot of low light scenes or shots of the sky. This is because of something called color bit depth. When computers store information, they store it in units called bits. A bit is either a zero or a one, on or off. And this is how binary code works. Color is stored this way too. Early computers had a very low color bit depth, the earliest ones having only four bits of color data. With four bits, you can store 16 different colors or 16 combinations of four ones and zeros. This is what this gradient looks like with only four bits of color. It's not very accurate and there's so much banding, but just like black and white images, we can reduce this by dithering. Dithering color allows you to represent more shades and colors using a limited palette. Now this is far from perfect, but it's certainly better than the original. As computing power increased, so did the quality of pixels and the number of bits. With eight bits instead of four, you can get 256 color options, which can still have some color banding, but responds much better to dithering. Most modern displays use 24-bit color. This gives each pixel three separate sets of eight bits each, one for red, one for green, 
and one for blue. This results in 16.7 million colors that you can present on 24-bit screen. This is why GIFs have more color banding, because by using a lower bit depth for the GIF, they greatly reduce the file size. In Minecraft, we're working with a very limited palette. We only have around 300 blocks, and many of them are similar colors, so we have to be clever to make our gradients work. Adding some randomness to your gradients can do wonders, and you can even try some dithering patterns to see what works best for your project. Humans are surprisingly bad at creating random, natural-looking things. We really like to pick out patterns and introduce order. Loosening up a bit and letting things fall where they will can help things look more organic and less intentional, and always take a step away and then come back to see if your opinion has changed later. If you're working on a project and you need to give your eyes a break, why not head over to my website and check out my new merch? Socks, hats, shirts, hoodies, and even this beautiful piece of cloth. I've changed distributors, so many of these items can be shipped from international locations, which should drastically reduce the shipping prices for those of you who live outside of the US. As always, I promise that my educational content will be free for everyone. These videos take a lot of time and research, and if you do want to help out, the best way to do so is by joining my Patreon. You can get early access to all my videos, some sneak peeks, and all of my builds are available for download. These same things are available for everyone that subscribes to me on Twitch as well through my Discord. Links for all of this stuff are down in the description. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll be back soon with a bonus episode about audio dithering, which I didn't know was a thing until I started researching this, and I'll be getting some help from my music and audio guy, Mossbot. So I'll see you soon, go do something creative, and uh, we will be back. There's still more to talk about. This, what, this was a rabbit hole. I'll see you guys soon.